Okay, well, uh, thank you all for inviting me. Um, as I'm listening to you uh, chat about um, your organization and getting started, everything you're doing, um, the uh, in doing the research um, that I've been doing for this book, um, it's uh, I thought you know we here in the U.S. we have to be like 20 years behind. Um, you all in the UK and most of Europe uh, and the whole thinking about systems theory and systems design. Um, and now I'm absolutely convinced that you're way ahead of us. Um, and uh, so I just really appreciate the opportunity of being with you um, as you are mostly there in the UK, I think uh, it's dinner time. Um, I'm uh, just finishing up my first cup of coffee for the morning. Um, I am sitting in my office in Redmond, Washington and i um, um, not sure how many of you have ever heard of Redmond, Washington, but you've probably heard of uh, one of the larger employers in the city of Redmond called Microsoft. Um, where I'm sitting right now is about two miles from their world headquarters and half of the real estate in this town is taken up by, uh, by Microsoft. Um, uh, and I do really appreciate this opportunity, and uh, it's a great thrill and great honor for me to be speaking with a group um, in Europe. So this is ex just exceptionally fun for me. Um, a bit of a background of um, the research that uh, has now resulted in a book that just came out called Leveraging the Genetics of Leadership, Cracking the Code of Sustainable Team Performance. Um, I've been a management consultant for 25-ish years. Um, I've worked with, you know, a couple hundred different organizations, uh, primarily in the public sector, healthcare, nonprofit, a uh, little bit of commercial work. And several years ago, I began to ask myself the question, how do the highest performing organizations in the world, how do they approach the, the practice of leadership? And I was really looking for organizations that, in a sense, have stood the test of time. Um, I wasn't interested in looking at organizations where they've done something great for a year or two or three. Um, I was really looking for organizations that have been outstanding contributors, both to their industry, both to humanity, to their communities, not for a year or two, but four, five, six, eight, 10, 20 years. And uh, what I and there was a and there was a sort of a back question to that. I was curious to know whether or not there would be anything about their approach to leadership that would be systemic. And uh, frankly, I didn't really even know what that meant. Uh, and I won't go into all the research behind all this stuff. Um, if you want to ask me about it later, you, you absolutely can. By the way, in your green, amber, red. Um, uh, this this is all this would all be green if you want to take this I don't care I'd be honored for, if you felt like it was worthy of being shared with your colleagues and friends, but um, the research was really focused on on leadership, how high impact organizations approach leadership. Was there anything about the way they about their approach to leadership that might be considered systemic, and then I had to figure out well what does that mean. So um, what I discovered is that uh, organizations that really take a systemic approach to leadership, and this is kind of the theme of, my, of, of the morning, they produce both high employee engagement, meaning they have found ways to unleash the basic human capacities for creativity, innovation, and problem solving, as well as producing exceptional customer value. For example, I've got, I'm gonna give you a case study that's in the book uh, today of a manufacturing company. They literally have customers waiting in line to do business with them. Um, and uh, uh, I'm on a bit of a rant and a roll right now about this because this morning I was in, a, in another Zoom call and um, uh, a couple that I know uh, were receiving an award for their community service. And the, uh, the person introducing them said, you know, they have put people over profits. 
and and I was wanting to come right out of my chair saying, first of all, I know them. They don't put, they don't, it's not an either or op option for them. They both produce terrific pro profits and they value people. And one of the things that I, I saw in my research is that high impact organizations, they do not sacrifice profit for people, nor do they sacrifice people for profit. In fact, I would say every organization I found that approaches leadership in, in this way, looking at it systemically, it is their approach with their people that drives profits, drives customer value, and they're producing exceptional, I would even go so far as to say extraordinary profit and value for their customers. And if you can't tell, I'm pretty passionate about that right now because of my earlier, earlier Zoom call. Um, before I get in this, let me let me share a bit of a personal story with you that probably many of you can um, can appreciate. When my son was in the sixth grade, and he just turned, I think, 28 yesterday, so however many years that goes, when he was in the sixth grade, he announced that he wanted to go out for the uh, the school basketball team. Now that in itself wasn't a real big statement, except that this school that he went to, it was a very, very small private school. Um, they, it was even a question whether or not they would even have enough boys uh, to field a team. Um, but they, they were able to put, the, put together, the, I think they needed to have 10 boys uh, to play on this team, and they barely got the 10 boys. And um, uh, none of these boys were terrific athletes. They're all just boys who wanted to play basketball. And their coach was a young man named Will, who um, had played some basketball in high school, and I think he had played a little bit in college. Um, he was not a highly experienced uh, basketball coach. He was actually a part-time youth worker, and he needed some extra money to uh, further his schooling. So he was asked uh, if he would mind coaching this basketball team, and he said, sure. What these boys lacked in talent, however, and what this coach lacked in experience was that this coach, besides teaching the, just the simple basics of how to play the game of basketball, um, ball handling skills, he did something, and I'm not even sure that he knew what he was doing at the time, but he put together a system for those boys of how to play the game of basketball. And the system said, you will, you will play the game of basketball unselfishly for the benefit of the team. And um, uh, I'd love to tell you that as um, these young boys played their first year together uh, on the school basketball team that they won the state championship. Or the or their league champion championship. The unfortunate reality is that these boys lost every one of their games, and they didn't lose just by little margins. They basically got blown out of most all of their games. If they came within five points um, of the of the winning uh, team, it was a victory. Um, the second year, these boys did a little bit better. They won about half the games. And I've often wondered, why didn't any of these boys quit? Uh, they were playing on a colossal, colossally uh, uh, failed team, but yet not one of these boys quit. And the reason is, I think, is because these boys learned how to play unselfish team basketball. So if they quit, they would have been quitting on their best friends. The third year, the unthinkable happened. Excuse me. These boys from a modest school of modest talent, actually, they were the smallest school in their league, went undefeated. They won every one of their games and they all became champions. <laughs> And um, it's been a lot of years since, but I still get emotional because I would wish this kind of experience on every boy or girl. 
Now, there's about three lessons um, about this story that I would like to offer that I think is important for those of us who um, are thinking about systems, we're practitioners of systems. Um, I am very much a practitioner. I am not a theorist. Um, the name of my company is Praxis Solutions, which means making the theoretical practical. Um, I love the theory. I love to discuss theory, but at the end of the day, it has to have some kind of practical value. So what I, what I, what I discovered is that, and you know this better than I do, systems always create more than the sum of their parts. The word that I choose to use is value. Systems create more value than the sum of their parts would indicate. So this little basketball team of sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade boys of modest talent, the system that coach will put them in and required them to play in produced ex exponentially more value than the talent of that basketball team. That's lesson number one. Lesson number two is that systems, I think, um, we understand systems the best with a long view. Um, it took three years for the system that Coach Will was teaching to really get embedded into the, into the mindset of these boys. And it took three years of training and coaching to get them to think unselfishly for their team. The third, um, the, the, the third lesson here is that uh, the right system, and I don't care if it's an athletic system, if it's a business system, or what we're gonna be talking about, a leadership system can take people of average talent and turn them into champions. Let me say that again, because I think it's so important that we really understand this. The right system and I'm gonna be talking specifically about the leadership system, can take men and women of average leadership talent and turn them into champions. However, the way we look at leadership today, I think needs a major overhaul. Uh, I love the introduction that I heard you speaking about earlier um, of how uh, you believe that um, a proper approach to systems thinking, to the practice of systems would um, solve many of the organizational problems that we find ourselves in. And I absolutely believe that. And in this case, I'm gonna be, I'm addressing the system of leadership. Um, and, and here in the States, I think we're just now coming to that conclusion. Uh, research from, from researchers from places like Harvard, University, Stanford University, which if you're not familiar with Stanford, it's out here on the West Coast. It's sort of the Harvard of the West Coast. Uh, McKinsey Company and Gallup are all beginning to, to recognize that our current approach to leadership is no longer working. Uh, Jeffrey Pfeiffer, who teaches at Stanford University in his latest book, uh, Leadership BS, says it's not just that all of the efforts to create better leaders is, is making better leaders, is actually making them worse. So here's some evidence of that. Um, every two years, I think Gallup uh, produces a report called the, the, the Amer State of the American Workforce Workplace Report. Um, my understanding that, um, um, that while the report is very U.S. focused, that the, the number of the data is very similar in, uh, uh, in, in Europe. Um, if it's not, forgive me for my uh, Northwest centric presentation. Um, but uh, the latest report shows that 35% of the workforce is engaged, meaning they're psychologically, uh, psychological owners of their work. 13% are actively disengaged, which means they are actively sabotaging their workplace. And 52% are not engaged. And this is the group that um, we go to work, we put in our time, we do our job, we go home, and we basically don't care. Uh, we do what we're told to do. 
uh, we do our work, we show up on time, we leave on time, but fully half of us are not psychologically engaged with our work. And as you can see over time, that number has not budged over the last 20 years. And there is all kinds of discussion, at least here in the States. Um, I see it on LinkedIn. There's all kinds of, um, of podcasts. I've been on several podcasts the last couple of months. And virtually every podcast is trying to figure out how do we get more people engaged? Um, I, was on a, I was on a call, I think it was Friday, and the, uh, the gentleman said, you know, we've been talking about engagement for 20 years. How come we can't do anything about it? And I think the answer to that is very, very simple. Gallup tells us the answer. 70% of the variability of workforce engagement is tied directly to the manager. So we have to conclude, I think, that the reason we have so many people who are not actively engaged with their work is because of their manager and their relationship to their manager. So what are, are our typical solutions to um, uh, leadership, the lack thereof, how to, how to, uh, how to uh, achieve an organization that has high employee engagement. Well, the, the, the typical response is, well, we need to do a better job of, of developing leaders. Well, there's only a couple of problems with that. One, in this country, 66% of all first time managers don't get any leadership training at all. Um, one of the first people I interviewed for this book was a young man by the name of Brian and uh, Brian is a brilliant civil engineer. Um, he's leading his company's entrance and using virtual reality to design large public, uh, uh, public works projects. Um, when he was in 33, 34, he applied for an internal position within the company that would name him one of 300 emerging leaders leading um, one of the world's largest engineering companies, company of, uh, 19,000 employees and 5 billion in revenue. When he was telling me this, I said, so let me guess. Um, when they gave you this, this title, they sent you off to a month of leadership development school so, they, so you would know how to lead uh, the company. And as he's an engineer, so he takes everything serious. His eyes got big, he said, no, they didn't do anything. I said, don't take it personal because that's the norm. This company of $5 billion in revenue, 19,000 uh, employees couldn't spare a nickel, or maybe I should say a dollar, um, to make sure that, that he is, uh, was successful. Another reason why leadership development doesn't work is because most of the development work is personal development masquerading um, as leadership development. And I have no problem at all with people uh, going to uh, uh, training to be better human beings. Um, and that's all great, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they will have, they will, uh, have better abilities to lead their companies and their organizations. Another reason that the training doesn't work is that they can't implement what they do learn because there's no systems perspective. And that's where organizations like you guys, I think has so much value and opportunity to start telling, to, to get the, um, to communicate that organizations are, are a network of interlocking systems. One of which I will be offering to you today is in fact leadership. And so when people go off to leadership training, they come back and they can't implement what they do learn because there's already an existing system in place that won't let them. Um, too often the training is divorced from organizational values, mission, vision, and the and other systems that are in place. Um, nationally here in the States, the most common number that we get uh, for annual investment in leadership development is $50 billion. Um, I have seen numbers that go as high as $356 billion uh, investment in leadership development worldwide. And it's, uh, I find it interesting having raised one that millennials are actually the most critical of leadership development because of lack of innovation, no on the job impact, 
lack of expertise from outside sources. And if anybody's bothering to take notes, six out of 10 millennials are actively looking for a new job at any point in time. So that's the, that is the state, I think, um, of the way we currently approach the practice of leadership. So what's the solution? Number one, I think it's to understand that organizational leadership is not so much about a person as it is uh, a system. Uh, a system that can be designed that will create both an exciting workplace, a workplace where people can go to work, they feel value, they feel significance, they can contribute. They can contribute to, their, to the, the best part of, the, of their humanity, which is creativity, innovation, and problem solving. Um, one of the people um, that I first ran into was talking about this and who has since become a bit of a mentor is uh, Dr. Barbara Kellerman. Uh, Dr. Kellerman teaches uh, at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government in uh, Boston. And one of her latest books, uh, Professionalizing Leadership, this is what she says. I think of leadership now as a system, the leadership system. And when we think about it, you know, uh, we all, every organization has some kind of system to take care of customers, to develop strategy, to execute strategy, to tie in their operations with their strategy, to uh, innovate um, as well as systems to take care of employees, make sure employees get paid, hiring, firing, et cetera. Until we come to the idea of leadership and then we put a face on it. And um, Parak was asking me uh, uh, about uh, the current state of politics um, uh, here in the, here in the states, and I think um, the, the the one of the the issues that we face right now is that we put so much uh, almost a pathological um, emphasis on a leader, and um, as you probably know, uh, here in the states we love our independence. That's why we have a day of independence. Um, we love the the myth of the or the theory of the mythic leader, the, the leader who's gonna take us to the promised land of success. And that's one of the reasons why I think we're in such a mess politically right now is that we, we, we believe that leadership is a person and I'm not discounting the value of an individual person, but when we think about it as a system, now all of a sudden we can bring all of, the, all of our organizational resources to bear to create uh, organizations that, that do both take care of people and produce exceptional economic returns or stakeholder returns if the organization might be a social service or a healthcare organization. So what is a leadership system? And um, the way I like to describe it, if I saw one walking down the street, how would I recognize it? And um, what you're looking at right now took about a year and a half of, of research and reading more books and articles than I ever would ever care to admit. Um, but I ended up using uh, Donella Meadows' definition of a system and then a, simply adapting that to the definition of a leadership system, which is a systematic model of leadership that comprehensively designs the way key organizational resources interact so that they achieve a desirable and measurable purpose. You know, I'm gonna take these three ideas, I'm gonna illustrate them in a case study in just a minute, but let me briefly just walk you through the, the three parts of this. So the first part is a purpose, and you know probably better than I do that every system has a purpose. There's an outcome, there's an output. And so one of the things I discovered is that high impact organizations that intentionally design a system of leadership, they all have a purpose for their leadership and always, and I would underscore always, it begins with the experience of the workforce. That was a huge surprise for me. It always begins with the experience of the workforce. The second thing that I saw is how they think about and use organizational resources. 
and every organization, and I don't care if it's an organization of one or an organization of two million like the United States Army, uh, who I actually profile in the book, they all have three primary resources, people, money, and I'm, I'm using money in its broadest term, broadest sense, meaning plant and equipment and technology, and knowledge. What I found is that high impact organizations, they look at these resources and the, oper the operative word here is value. They see these resources as resources of value that they can develop for ever more value. And then the third part is interactions. And as, as you know, every, every system has elements and resources that interact organizationally, what I found was that these resources interact through rules, routines, and then the marriage of behaviors and values to produce the purpose. Now I'm gonna jump screens on you here and talk about uh, one of the companies that I, I profile in the book called Cass Taylor. Uh, Cass Taylor uh, designs and manufactures, uh, manufactures custom, uh, high-end custom commercial furniture. They employ a little over 200 people. Um, I doubt that anybody, any of you have ever heard of Cass Taylor, but if I told, told you the names of their client customers, I'm quite positive you would have, you would, you, every, one, every one of them you would recognize. They're all uh, well-known, well-established national and international brands. Um, they, uh, they were founded in the late 1980s. In 2006, they formally adopted the Toyota production system. And if you were to take a tour of their company or talk to them, everything you would hear about and see is Kaizen. Um, and I'm, I don't care if you're familiar with the word T uh, lean or Kaizen, they happen to call it Kaizen. And if you talk to them, you would see Kaizen. But what's in back of their, of, their, of their concept of Kaizen and the Toyota production system is something that I don't think is talked about nearly enough, which is the Toyota management system, which by the way, they define as a system of leadership. Um, they also, uh, CAS also has a, literally a, a waiting list of customers. They have, they pick and choose the customers they will serve. And if you'd call them up and say, I want to be your customer, they will run you through a 10 point scale to make sure they want to do business with you. Um, it's an astonishing company. Um, when I, um, um, when I, I took their a tour and then had an opportunity to speak with their um, one of their senior leaders and then uh, their, their CEO, I was really stunned by the, the way they approach the development of these three resources of money, people, and knowledge. So this is really their, their model. And um, I could tell you, um, I'm not selling servant leadership. Um, it's just what they happen to decide as the way they want to approach um, their leadership system. I ran into other companies that they start out with a value of respect. Others start out with a value of relationship. Others I found start out with a value of, of, um, of safety, et cetera. But this company happened start to start out with servant leadership. And when I, when I was talking with the CEO, uh, in fact, there's kind of a funny story. When I was taking the tour, um, you know, they were talking about Kaizen and Lean, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm trained in Lean and Kaizen. I know how to do it. I know how to, you know, I, I, know I take my clients through those kinds of, of, of engagements on a fairly routine basis. But when we got done um, with the tour, it's a four-hour tour, I said, so um, is there any overriding um, way that you approach leadership because leadership hadn't come up in any of the discussions. And Todd, their production manager, is kind of a big guy, bigger than me anyway, he gets up out of his chair, walks over towards me, looks down at me and says, we practice servant leadership. And I'm looking up at him and thinking, well, that's what I saw, but your body language is, is really interesting. But they practice servant leadership 
so that their staff can be the front line. Um, uh, they're on the front line in the battle to find and, elim and eliminate waste in the manufacturing and design process. So if you were to ask them, how do you approach leadership? What you're gonna hear is, well, we expect all of our leaders to model servant leadership. And when you think about that, that's really talking about the experience of the workforce. And then when they talk about finding and eliminating waste in, the, in, the, in their processes, that's the value to the company. So when we um, talk about uh, developing the resources of people, money, and knowledge, let me give you a, a, one of the stories that I heard. So in, that, in this company, the, the idea of servant leaders means the leaders, the production leads, the managers, their number one goal is to support the workforce to find and eliminate waste. So um, to do this, so this is one story that I'll share it quickly with you. So um, we're going through the tour and there's a woman who, t who is starting to explain to us how, uh, and she, she runs a big cutting machine that takes foam core material uh, for their furniture big pieces and they, she cuts it into parts. And she said, uh, she told us she realized that um, in, in developing in cutting the big pieces of raw material that she was getting, she was getting four parts out of each piece of, of larger foam core material, but she thought that they can get five parts if they just reconfigured the, uh, the, the raw material a little bit. So she said, she, she said, I went to my mentor who then coached me through the process. And several times she used this word mentor. And every time she did, she would turn slightly to a woman who was standing next to her, who hadn't said a word. So finally, when she gets done with her story, I have to ask the obvious question, which was, so who is this woman standing next to her, next to you, is this your supervisor? And she looked at me, no joke, she looked at me like I was from outer space and she said, well, yeah, I guess so, but we just call them mentors. So in this system, every leader is trained to be a servant leader and a mentor. That's actually what they call them. That's their title. And they are trained to develop their people so that their people can find and eliminate waste create more value out of their plant and equipment. And it is their people who is innovating every day and creating new knowledge and information. So the third, the third part of this, and I'm gonna take this from the, the bottom and work up. So in this company, they have a, a, they have a rule and it's all designed to support the practice and the culture of servant leadership. The rule is that machines serve people, not people serve machines. And uh, uh, they told me about uh, not too long ago, they had bought a very expensive uh, numeric cutting machine for, their, uh, for the wood frames. And they, all, they practice um, single flow. So getting the you know, a precise cut the first time is really important. And they spent a lot of money on, on this machine, but after about three weeks, they realized that it required more steps for people. And they sold the machine because they have a rule that says machines serve people and not people serve machines. And so they sold the machine. I'm thinking if I'm the accountant, I'm gonna have a heart attack when I see the, the loss on that machine. But that is a rule and they follow that rule. They have made Kaizen a daily routine. In fact, they are so passionate about Kaizen that they provide paid time off for anybody who actually conducts a Kaizen for the company, but they also provide the same time off even if it's a Kaizen for your home. So I heard stories of people getting uh, paid time off for conducting how to organize a sailboat. 
And then I heard a really funny story of one of their senior managers. Um, I thought it was funny anyway. Um, his um, very pregnant wife, um, or his wife was quite pregnant and, she, and he thought that she would be um, quite pleased if he reorganized her kitchen pantry. And so he reorganized his kitchen pantry. He got his paid time off, um, except his wife wanted to kill him. <laughs> she was not real happy with the fact that she, he reorganized uh, her kitchen pantry. No blood was spilled, but I understand that a, a young husband her, uh, learned a very important lesson. Um, they have also made training a routine. So they will, they will train any worker to do any job virtually at any time. So in their system of servant leadership, if I was working there and I was operating a cutting machine and I looked over and I thought, hmm, you know, those, those the people doing purchasing looks like they're having a lot of fun. I wanna learn how to do that job. My supervisor's job then is to get me in line to be trained how to be a purchasing, um, to be in their purchasing group. And they, they, do, per, they do training every day from eight o'clock in the morning to 8.05 in the morning. Training happens every day for five minutes. Now you say, why five minutes? And the reason, reason is pretty simple. They realize that sending someone off to a lecture-based training doesn't have a lot of value because by the time you walk out the door, you've, you've forgotten half of it. So, but in five minutes, if, um, uh, so I'm looking at Benjamin right now. Benjamin, ben, if I want to learn how to do Benjamin's job, every job has been broken down into five-minute increments. So if Benjamin is my trainer, I could say, Benjamin, teach me that job. And you're going to say, okay, the first training session is going to be tomorrow. And Benjamin, you could probably teach me a five-minute snippet of how to do that purchasing job because the next day I'm going to be teaching it. Because as, as you all know, and we all recognize the best way to learn a topic or to learn a body of knowledge is to teach it. So they've broken every job down into five minute increments. I'll learn how to do that particular job today. Tomorrow I'm gonna to teach that class. That is a routine. Now core behaviors, um, one of the things I noticed is that these high impact organizations, they tie core values uh, directly with what I call foundational behaviors of their, of their leadership. Let me give you just one real simple example. Um, the United States Army has a core value called selfless service. That is a core value of the, value of the United States Army, two million active and reserve duty uh, personnel. They define selfless service in a behavior and, they, and they, they define it in this way. If you're an officer in the United States Army, your job is to um, uh, look after the welfare of the nation, the Army, and your subordinates before your own. So they've taken the value of selfless service and they, they and they define it in a behavior. So one of the people that I interviewed uh, for the book uh, is a retired four-star general, brilliant man. Um, he has uh, uh, done everything within uh, the army that's, poss that, that's possible. Um, and I asked him, I said, so how is it the army uh, reinforces that idea of selfless service and ties that in with servant leadership. And he says, it's very simple. Um, he said, when a team is going out on a mission, the person who gets on, who, who gets on that helicopter last is the highest ranking officer. The person who gets off that helicopter first is the highest ranking officer. They're going to put themselves in harm's way first because their job is to look after the welfare of the, of the, of the nation, the army, 
and their subordinates. So it's the highest ranking officer that gets off, um, that, that gets on, on that helicopter last and gets, gets off the first. I hope I'm saying that all correctly. So what's the result? And I'm just about done. What's the result for Cass Tailored for this little company of 200 people? Well, every year their employees, not the CEO, not the CFO, not the COO, not their production leads or managers, the employees themselves initiate 1,000 to 1,250 Kaizans every year. Do the math and not everybody participates obviously, but the simple math says every employee every year is identifying five to six opportunities to improve the company, to improve the value that they're delivering to their customers. Each Kaizen saves the company about $1,000. That equates out to four to 5% of gross sales every year. Every year they're extracting four or 5% of gross sales out of the company's cost structure, which if you think about it, gives them enormous flexibility. They can take that additional value, they could pass it on to their customers, they could take it as a form of profits, they could pass it directly on to employees in terms of a greater profit sharing uh, program. So it gives them enormous flexibility. Um, and uh, in 2000, I think 12 or 13, they started giving tours because there were so many people wanting to know how, how it is that they were doing what they were doing. And um, two years ago, when I took my tour, 40,000 people had walked through um, their, their door just to see how they, see how they operate. And they've, uh, year or two, about a year ago, they formally spun off a consulting practice and the, the, the first customers for the consulting practice, one was a, a well-known well US-based fashion brand. And then another was a national healthcare organization in a country just to your east. And I'm sort of sworn to secrecy on who. So here's the opportunity that I think we have when we apply systems thinking to the practice of leadership. One is that we can create organizations where human beings can absolutely flourish, where they, they can contribute the very best of themselves, psychologically, intellectually, and emotionally be engaged with their work, where work becomes a place of satisfaction, value, and significance. And we can also create organizations that produce exponentially um, or, or unparalleled value for their customers, for their employees, for their community, unparalleled um, financial performance, however it is we're gonna measure financial performance. So, um, Benjamin, I think, um, as I think last May, I asked uh, Benjamin through uh, LinkedIn, Hey, do you know anybody uh, in, in England who, who might write a, a reference or endorsement for this book? Somebody who, um, um, you know, has something to do with uh, systems theory. And um, I had been looking at, for, at uh, Dr. Midgley and um, wondering if, it, if anybody knew him and wondering how I might be able to get in touch with him. And... Um, uh, Benjamin, you said, I think you suggested I, I, I give, I look him up. I sent him an email and a few days later, it was a Sunday morning. I was talking, speaking with him on the phone and I could not have been more um, pleased, honored, um, pleasantly surprised. This was a piece of the whole uh, endorsement that he wrote for the, for the book. And this is just taking a snippet out of it. He said this, an organization becomes effective because it works as a system, a set of functional parts interacting to achieve a purpose a, and leadership as one such necessary part. Indeed, what if leadership itself is a system, a subsystem of the wider organization? If leadership is a system engaged in relationships with other systems to create a high performance high-performing, purposeful whole. It means that anybody, 
with integrity and a reasonable level of emotional intelligence can learn how to lead. And I would take you back to my original story of these young boys who were learning how to play basketball, uh, who came from a very small school, who had modest talent themselves, but they had a coach who taught them how, how to play into a system of unselfish team basketball. And in three years, they became champions. So let me quickly finish. Um, if uh, any of these ideas uh, trigger any conversation points with you, my website is danieleds.com. Um, and um, just uh, because I, I am so honored for the opportunity to speak with you all, um, if you want a complimentary copy of the book, um, uh, go to my website. There's a connect page there. Send me a note that says send me a copy of the, of the book and I will email you the, 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 the PDF version of the book. Or if it's easier, just send me an email at dan at danieleds.com. I would be more than happy to send you the PDF version of the book. No, um, no money being asked for. So with that, I would love to have any comments. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, if you have any comments, questions, I would love to entertain them. Okay, guys, your chance. Got a few minutes to ask some questions of Dan. Patrick. Dan, how'd you do? Um, Love the story about the, uh, the basketball team. I'm just wondering how much of this you reckon can be codified in terms of behaviors and that's actually get picked up by, by people in organizations. Yeah. And how much of it is at the level of kind of principles and values and how much of it's at the level of behaviors? Um, great question. And what I, what I saw was it's all about behaviors and they codify it. In fact, um, I, I, I had it on one of the slides and I didn't mention it, but uh, almost every organization I looked at um, had some kind of, and it, they came by different names. One uh, was, uh, this is our charter. Um, another one, these are our guiding principles. Um, I was speaking actually with a gentleman this past Friday who uh, started a, uh, it's a, it's a, a technology slash construction company. And um, I said, so as he's going through sort of the, how they want to work together as a team, and this is a team of 250 employees. Mm -hmm. um, I said, so uh, is there any, any document that brings all of this stuff together in terms of how you're working together, um, the rules, the routines, the behaviors, and the values? He said, yeah, in fact, he said, I started out with a 13 page document um, then I realized no one read 13 pages. So then I, um, I whittled it down to uh, three pages and I realized that people still weren't reading three pages. So he said, I got it down to four sentences, but those four sentences define our rules, behaviors and routines and how it all links to our, our core values. Um, uh, one of the people I spoke with was uh, an elementary school principal um, and this school um, of 450 students went from the lowest performing school in a district of 25,000 students. It was failing on multiple fronts. In five years, it was the highest performing elementary school. And then when that wasn't good enough, they took it up and actually began to close the achievement gap, which in this country is the gap between rich and poor, minority, majority, et cetera, which is a massive, massive accomplishment. And she actually brought up, I didn't even have to coach her to get to the idea of behaviors and rules and routines and values. She brought it up and, uh, uh, and she said, we have a charter and every year we review our charter and the charter says, this is how we're going to behave. This is the rules of engagement. And, and the value of that for the manager is, and this guy I was talking to on Friday said exactly the same thing. He said, he says, I have these four sentences. He said, we, we hire people in the construction business. And a lot of times people coming in to us in, in out of the construction business, they like to yell and scream and we don't yell and scream. We don't tolerate, we don't allow it. He said, and we have to retrain them. 
He says, I've got this sheet of paper that says, okay, you've chosen to be part of this team. This is how the team behaves. It was like Coach Will, you know, teaching his boys how to play team basketball. And he, and, uh, and he said, this is how, this is, you know, you've been given this. This is how we behave in this company. If you want to yell and scream, you take yourself off the team. So what do you want to do? So I would say it very much becomes codified and how they operate. Great question. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks. Uh, may I, Alan Hopkirk from Roche, have a question? Sure. I think it's a hard one, but let's see. Um, so if I adopt the belief or my company adopts a belief that, that good leadership or outstanding leadership is the result of an extraordinary system with ordinary people and that leaders are servants to the people who work for them, which I like, what does a fair compensation system look like in such a company? You know, that's a um, that's an interesting question because um, this is universally what I found. That first of all, I don't have an answer to your system, but I do have an observation. Um, it's not about compensation. In fact, I would go so far as to say it has little to do with compensation. Now. Clearly, um, you have to be competitive. Um, but let me, let me give you just one example from this Cass Taylor. Um, so they practice servant leadership. Servant leadership comes with certain values and behaviors. So um, a few years ago, uh, Jeff began to notice that other manufacturing firms in the area where he is, uh, he's located started picking off some of his best people because they were so well-trained. Um, now, he had an option at that point. He could either fight that, he could put up barriers and roadblocks from people leaving him to go to a different company. They weren't competitors. They were just companies that, and just because of their industry, could pay more. And so he logically said, we're practicing servant leadership. My job as the CEO of this company is to serve my employees. How do I handle this? And so he went to several of those other employees of the, several of those other companies and said, how can I better train my people to go from my organization where I have certain limits on what I can pay to your organization where they have more economic opportunity? And they told him. And he's actually building those other skill sets into his own training. And when I asked him, I said, hey, if, if someday, if, you know, if, if how, how would you measure, because as you guys know really well, every system can be measured. It's one of, the, one of the basic attributes of a system. You can measure it. So I asked Jeff, how would you measure, you know, your approach to leadership? He said, Someday, I think it will be the number of people we can bring into our company, and his company is largely made up of people who are uh, fairly new to the U.S. You go into their lunchroom, and it's like an international, international food bazaar. You just want to sit there and have lunch. Um, but he said, it will, eventually, it will be the number of people we can, we can bring into our company, train them in Kaizen, and then move them on to a company where they have greater economic opportunity. Now, I would ask you, how many actually make that move when they have the option to go to a company of higher economic opportunities, how many of them actually do when they realize they're not gonna be working in the same kind of culture? 